In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's rare to read an entire letter of St. Paul at one service. Today we did just that. We read the letter of Paul to Philemon. This is a unique letter, seemingly delivered to a single person. And it was delivered alongside the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Both letters were delivered at the same time. This letter is addressed to Philemon, a man who lived in Colossae, ran a house church, and was probably wealthy. This letter also deals with an incredibly sensitive subject, slavery. Main topic of this letter is not slavery as an economic system in the ancient world, but the relationship between Philemon, Onesimus, and Paul. It's important to distinguish that there were major differences between slavery in the Roman-dominated Middle East and what we often think about when we hear the term slavery. When Americans think about slavery, We think about the abhorrent results of the transatlantic slave trade for which our country is still dealing with the consequences. Slavery in the Roman Empire took a wide range of forms. Many doctors were slaves. Often slaves were educated scribes and some household slaves of significant homes managed estates or wielded more power than most free persons. Slavery in the Roman Empire was not ethnically based. Romans were happy to enslave anyone. These facts in no way make slavery any less evil than we all know it to be. It's in this context we find Onesimus and Philemon and their interaction with St. Paul. We know that from the letter, we know from the letter that Onesimus is a runaway household slave. The reason he ran away is not directly known, but many have presumed that he stole money from Philemon after not completing his duties and ran to avoid punishment. The consequences of his actions, had he returned to Philemon, would have been drastic, to say the least. In his time away from Philemon, Onesimus meets Paul and converts to Christianity. Paul sends him back to Philemon with this letter. In the letter, Paul makes an unbelievably counter cultural statement to Philemon. Paul says he can command Philemon to do his duty and receive Onesimus as a brother, but instead Paul leaves the decision up to Philemon. Paul says perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul then says that any debt owed to Philemon by Onesimus should be put on Paul's tab. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and the waters of baptism, Paul has turned a slave into a brother in Christ. And not only a brother, but a brother who should be received in this house church just as they would receive Paul himself. The unbelievable 
equality that living into the gospel creates in this letter is incredible. Not only that, but many scholars believe that Onesimus would have been a co-equal missionary working besides Philemon to grow the church. We know that later, Ignatius of Antioch said in his writing that the bishop of Ephesus was named Onesimus. Well, we can't be sure. I'd like to think that they are one and the same. From a runaway slave to bishop of the church. It would make a fantastic movie, wouldn't it? The letter to Philemon is a truly uplifting story about Christians acting at their best, recognizing the errors of not only their ways, but the errors of society at large, and taking personal steps to fix those errors. We move from an uplifting to a epistle to a downright confusing gospel text today. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. For a church that has spent the past two weeks focusing on planting, water, watering, and growing, this message comes at an inopportune time. I thought about asking Ken to put that quote in the sign in front of the church this morning to see if it would affect attendance, but I didn't want to take the chance. I examined this text this week, and no matter what, no matter what, this is a hard thing to hear. It's not something that can simply be glazed over and put off to the side. The Greek word used here, hate, the Greek word is mase, and it indeed means to hate. But when used on a comparative basis, its meaning is to renounce one choice in favor of another. Jesus was a master at getting people's attention. And this statement would have done just that. The purpose was to show the cost of discipleship. To be in Christ is to put Jesus before everything else, everything else in your life. And to do that today, just like it was back then, is our free choice to make. We have freedom. We have the freedom to love Jesus. But with that freedom comes the understanding that in all we do, we must consider Jesus first. How we manage our household budget must start with Jesus. How we parent our children and how children treat their parents must start with Jesus. How we love our neighbors, especially those with nothing to offer us, must start with Jesus. And just like Philemon, how we interact with the society around us must start with Jesus. If Philemon had bowed to societal pressure, Onesimus would have been the victim of the death penalty at worst and a slave for life at best. In all our interactions, we must consider the grace of God that each of us has received through this church and then 
We must yearn to reflect and to share that grace with the world. However countercultural it may be to tithe to the church, to come alongside the poor and destitute, to obey our parents, to honor our children. To be a Christian in the 21st century, it's our call to do these things and so much more. Our call is to be new creations in Jesus. And to bring others in, to be made new by Jesus. To let go of the world's ways and to embrace and reflect God's love. May it be so here at St. John's. Amen.